Welcome to Arirang TV's continuing coverage of COVID-19. A growing number of people who survived their fight against the virus are reporting are raising much concern, that is, over their extended battle with post-viral symptoms. Now, we'll delve into these concerns during our studio session today. But first, here is our Kwon Soa with the latest numbers on the pandemic and our Kim Dami with related news. So I do start us off with the figures for this Tuesday here in Korea. Sure, Sunny. Korea reported 58 new infections this Tuesday, and we're seeing a drop in both domestic and imported cases. In fact, nine less cases when it comes to domestic as well as imported cases compared to Monday. And with that, uh, we see that for the fifth consecutive day, we have been in the double digits and also 18 cases less compared to yesterday. And the total number of cases in the country stands at... 25,333 and the death toll is at 447 with three additional fatalities and 71 people remain in serious or critical condition and we have 1,420 people remaining in quarantine and almost 100 people have made a full recovery. And now by region we see that 28 cases were reported in Gyeonggi-do province followed by 11 in the capital Seoul and in eight other provinces or cities we see single digits of new infections. And uh, meanwhile, some 12,000 tests have been conducted on Monday, and that is almost 7,400 more than the day before, uh, with many of those tests having been conducted in the metropolitan region. And that is as health authorities uh, started massive COVID-19 screenings at medical facilities in Seoul, Gyeonggi-do province, as well as Incheon, some 160,000 people regularly working or visiting mental hospitals or nursing hospitals as well as rehabilitation hospitals are to be tested until the end of this month. And uh, that is as a number of medical facilities have been emerging as sources of cluster infections in recent days. Right, so uh, meanwhile on the international front, an alarming development, so I see more countries have surpassed the one million mark. Yes, Sonny, and that is Spain and Argentina. So a total of six countries in the world now have over one million cases. And in the case of Spain and Argentina, that means roughly one out of 47 and 45 people respectively have COVID-19, with Spain's population at around 47 million and Argentina at 45 million. So these uh, six countries here with over 1 million cases plus France are also the countries that seat over 10,000 cases on a daily basis with the most uh, highest number of infections in the U.S. which reported some 69,000 in just a day. And in other places around the world, Europe of course a place with serious resurgences including the U.K. with some 18,000 new infections and also in Italy more more than 9,000 new cases in Germany also reported some 6,700 new infections. And in total, the globe has now over 40.6 million cases with some over uh, almost 307,000 new infections. And uh, the death toll stands at around 1.1 million with some 30.3 million recoveries. And those are the updates I have for now, but I'll be back with more after the government briefing. Sunny. All right, so I thank you for that. Back on the local front, as of this past Monday, the academic arena is seeking to establish a sense of normality with schools allowed to accommodate two thirds of the student bodies. For more on this, I have our Kim Dami here in the studio. Welcome, Dami. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, Dami, let's begin with the reopening of schools, especially that of our first graders. Right, so after seven months of uh, scheduled disruptions, first grade elementary school students are finally back in the classroom and will attend daily classes. Excitement was in the air at uh, schools of uh, schools nationwide as uh, teachers prepared a warm welcome for the students in public costumes, no less. Before Monday, the majority of schools in Korea only allow students to come to school once a week and had to rely mostly on distance learning. But virtual classes, in spite of all their benefits, have been tough both on students and parents alike. Since the kids weren't in school, I could see their posture or things like that loosen up. I was also worried that they weren't getting the chance to adapt to school as first graders. I couldn't meet with friends and play, but it's so much fun now that we're together. 
Education experts say it's especially important for first graders to study in class so they can learn to interact with teachers and classmates. This is a critical time for students to acquire basic lifestyle habits and build social skills by making friends. But there's a lot of concern that students are missing this critical time and that this could cause an education gap. But schools still need to take precautions to keep children safe. Students in other grades will be coming in on alternate days. To comply with the Tower Education Office guidelines, that call for a maximum of two-thirds of the student body to be at school at any one time. Meanwhile, Tommy, I hear the government is poised to hand out discount vouchers to jumpstart the domestic consumption. Tell us more. Right. So the South Korean government will be handing out discount vouchers once again that have been put on hold uh, due to distancing rules. And they can be spent on businesses that have been deemed to be safe. Around 10 million consumers are expected to reap the benefits and starting on a Thursday, tickets to the uh, performances like musicals and concerts will be offered at discounts of up to seven U.S. dollars or 8,000 Korean won when bought from online ticketing sites. For exhibitions at museums and art galleries, discounts will also be available at the door. Cinemas will offer discounts of their own starting at the end of the month. Those you can get when tickets are booked online. Fitness centers and gyms will also be getting help from the government to bring their customers back to. So in all, some 7.5 million vouchers will be issued in total. And to qualify for the program, businesses will have to follow strict disease prevention guidelines. Under the principle of thorough disease containment, businesses applying for the vouchers are obligated to comply with core prevention rules. Discount vouchers will be issued to consumers only if they, too, agree to comply with the rules. The voucher program originally began in August, but it had to be suspended amid the resurgence to COVID-19 outbreak in the country. And this time around, the restaurant and lodging industries have been excluded from the program because they pose a higher risk of spreading the virus. The government says, however, that it is looking for the right opportunity to help these industries as well. And South Korean President Moon Jae-in said that there is a greater need for these types of programs than ever before to bolster the ailing economy. The president also said the government is aware that the best way to support the economy is to fight COVID-19 first. Right. Tell me one more story before you go. I heard another local airline company is converting its uh, passenger planes into cargo carriers amid the sharp decline in air travel. Right, Sunny. So Jin Air, a low-cost uh, subsidiary of a Korean Air, is set to become the country's first budget carrier to convert its uh, passenger jets to cargo planes. This comes uh, with the uh, airline industry looking for new ways to survive amid the COVID-19 pandemic and global travel restrictions. Jin Air says it's converting one plane for now, which will make multiple flights a week to Bangkok and Qingdao to, uh, starting this weekend. It's a, it's a Boeing 777 which normally carries more than 300 passengers. And it's a new role. It will ferry clothing, electronic parts, and face masks, among other cargo. Junior's parent company, Korean Air, enjoyed a great success by retooling its passenger jets to carry cargo, reporting a surprise on net profit in the second quarter to tune of 137 million U.S. dollars. All right, Tommy, thank you for that broad coverage. Hope to see you again soon. My pleasure. Right, it's time now for the regular briefing on COVID-19 here in Korea. A recent poll by city officials shows four out of ten residents in the capital city, Seoul, believe they have been psychologically affected by the pandemic. Now, among the tougher challenges are the inability to fully indulge in travel or leisure activities, lack of social interactions, and job as well as income losses. Meanwhile, schools nationwide, as our Kim Dami has reported, have opened their doors wider, welcoming two-thirds of their student bodies to classrooms. For first graders, these in-person classes are poised to take place on a daily basis. The recent venture to school comes as part of the e-social guidelines here in the country. Uh, perhaps we can take a quick look at those guidelines 
guidelines as we wait for the briefing to commence. Now, there is no ban on public gatherings, but here in the metropolitan area, large-scale gatherings are still being discouraged. But should such events be held, authorities are calling for stringent safety measures and the proper spacing of people. Also, in the academic arena, cram schools of more than 300 people have resumed classes. With regard to high-risk establishments and operations, clubs, bars and uh, singing rooms as well as buffet restaurants are among the 11 that can resume business, while door-to-door -door sales activities remain banned. 16 other public use facilities such as cafes and ordinary restaurants in the capital region face tough safety measures while open. But those in other regions across the country have less stringent guidelines so, to follow. The briefing is about to start. We'll come back to you afterwards. Let us now begin our regular briefing for COVID-19 response here in South Korea for October 20th, Tuesday. As of today midnight, we have 41 new local infections, and the total caseload now stands at 25,333. 98 more people have been discharged, while 1,420 people still remain in quarantine. And the number of patients with severe or critical conditions stands at 71, and we had three additional fatalities. I extend my deepest condolences to the deceased and the members of the bereaved families. And let us now look at the major updates of COVID-19 infections here in South Korea by region. First of all, starting from the Seoul metropolitan city in relation to a social meeting in Gangnam and Socho districts, we have the first index case being confirmed at 15th of uh, October. We have nine more cases being confirmed. A total of 10 people have been confirmed to date. And in Gyeonggi-do province in Suwon, in relation to a family, we have seven additional people being confirmed. A total of eight have been confirmed to date. And in Gwangju city, uh, in relation to the SRC rehab hospital, we have four additional cases. Uh, the total has now jumped to 63. And also in Gyeonggi-do province, in relation to the Master Plus Hospital in Ujeongbu City, we also have seven additional being, uh, being uh, confirmed, and a total of 70 has been confirmed to date. And in Busan, at the Hetterak Nursing Hospital, we have one additional case, and a total of 74 have been confirmed to date. And as for the treatment and the remdesivir especially, it has been administered to a total of 637 patients across 63 hospitals here in South Korea. In relation to live quarantine measures, first of all, uh, we have the safety uh, e-report run by the safety ministry, and we have an example of a report of breaches on quarantine measures. And they were also... Um, in relation to not wearing face masks, also not having an entry log at facilities. And especially today, we would like to like to share an example of a wedding hall where people uh, did not wear face mask when they were taking a group photo at a wedding. And also at a restaurant, they did not wear face mask while they were um, conversing to each other. And we did not see also a restriction in the number of uh, uh, people who are attending these weddings. And the quarantine authorities would like to note that recently uh, the COVID-19 is spreading fast among uh, venues like uh, nursing hospitals, nursing homes, and mental hospitals and rehab hospitals as well. So we would like to continue to highlight the importance of complying with social, uh, complying with uh, quarantine measures at these uh, facilities. And all of the caregivers and staff members of these uh, venues need to wear face mask while they are working, and also they need to. Keep Keep, uh, to uh, keep ventilating the place and also disinfect the area on a regular basis and wash their hands on a regular basis as well. And all of the people who are visiting the facility as well need to keep a, a, a healthy distance with others. And if there are also any symptoms or any uh, possible suspected symptoms of COVID-19, uh, these needs should be monitored on a daily basis and he or her needs to get tested as soon as possible. And also if you have suspected the symptoms, uh, any workers who are working at these facilities need to uh, refrain from going to work so that they 
cut out the uh, transmissions to others. And the quarantine measures, we would like to continue to note that with the ease of social distancing measures to level one, uh, the government is continuing asking for the public to continue to enhance a level of uh, responsibility in carrying out the quarantine practices. And as for the public transportation and uh, demonstrations and also um, hospitals and nursing hospitals, as well as nursing long-term care centers, it is very important that you wear a face mask, and as this is uh, compulsory, uh, and uh, regardless of the social, uh, level of social distancing measures, please note that we will have a uh, penalization through fines uh, for users and the managers of these facilities. For over, we are able to ease the level of social distancing to the lowest level thanks to the public support and cooperation in the quarantine measures. So once again, we would like to highlight this fact. And going forward, we ask you to continue to comply with quarantine measures on a regular basis. And last but not least, we would like to note the following. Here in South Korea, COVID-19 is uh, continuing to uh, stabilize. However, when we uh, continue to uh, live um, our daily routines uh, at uh, the with the uh, ease of social distancing measures to level one, we believe uh, that the uh, report card of our achievements will be made uh, discovered very soon. Especially, we need to important uh, most importantly continue to cut off the chains of transmissions, and most fundamentally, we need to also cut down the number of silence spreaders within our community. And it is very important that we take particular precautions for any uh, environment which are confined, crowded, or have close contact. And it is very important for us to comply with quarantine measures as the future and as another possible outbreak of the COVID-19 depends on our efforts now. Currently, we are also seeing the COVID-19 spread very, uh, spreading very fast uh, in North America and many uh, advanced countries in Europe, which are some of the countries uh, which have been considered as role models when it comes to public health policies. However, they are witnessing a wide spread of the COVID-19. And we need to also ask ourselves how uh, we should uh, react to the virus so that we do not repeat uh, the mistakes that they are uh, seeing. And first of all, it is very important that the public individuals uh, need to continue to comply with quarantine measures and take part in the government's effort to contain the virus. For in certain countries, we have seen some demonstrations uh, which go against the government's quarantine uh, measures, and it, it was a very pity, a great pity to witness such trends. And second, it is very important that we see a continuity in these uh, measures as well. At a certain Eastern uh, European country, there was a there is a country that carried out uh, extensive uh, policy with, uh, with which is compulsory with a face wearing face mask. However, the discontinuity in these policies also led to a wide infections. And third, it is very important that we have a uniform policy going, uh, being impl implemented going forward. And if we have conflicting uh, or um, co conflicting uh, policies given by the government, we are seeing many examples of resurgences of the virus in many other countries. So we need to take these uh, examples uh, and we need to also prepare ourselves uh, to a prolonged uh, battle against the COVID-19. And here in South Korea, we are also witnessing some achievements in the area of R&D when it comes to uh, therapeutics and vaccines against COVID-19. It is very important that we are now going uh, through another phase in our battle against the COVID-19. And at this certain point of time, it is very important for us to contain the virus going forward and flatten the curve so that we can decrease uh, the number of victims, uh, especially in the uh, high-risk uh, group as well. And we can also minimize the damages inflicted by and uh, inflicted on the uh, small business owners as well. And we can also uh, man uh, stabilize uh, the confined uh, the number of confirmed cases by also having a safe and effective therapeutics and vaccine against the virus. So please check your temperature on a regular basis, on a daily basis, and 
and please refrain from visiting confined, crowded, close contact environments. And especially for the many youth and those in the middle aged group, we ask you to continue to monitor your health conditions. If you have any symptoms like flu, please also get tested as soon as possible. And please do not underestimate uh, these symptoms. So we ask you to comply with these measures. Thank you very much. Right, that was Kwon Janook, Deputy Director General of the Central Disease Control Headquarters, SOA, with Tuesday's afternoon briefing. What did he have to say? Well, let's start with the updates of new infections linked to cluster infections. There's one case in the capital Seoul, uh, which is linked to a gathering among friends or acquaintances, and the total now stands at 10, with nine cases confirmed as of this Tuesday. And also a gathering among family members in Gyeonggi-do province's Suwon has eight cases now. And uh, now when it comes to medical facilities at a rehabilitation hospital in Gyeonggi-do province, uh, 63 cases were confirmed with four additional cases and also there's a total of 70 cases at another hospital in Gyeonggi-do province and also down in Busan we heard of the massive uh, infection at a nursing hospital there that also has one additional case raising the total to 74. That is why Kwon again mentioned that these medical facilities are high-risk facilities where quarantine measures have to be abided by which means wearing face masks, washing hands and also sanitize hands often. This especially goes for people who work there and if they do feel any COVID-19 like symptoms they should get tested as fast as possible. He also stressed that at medical facilities, public transportation as well as during rallies everyone should wear face masks regardless of the social distancing, uh, uh, the level of the social distancing measures. All right, so thank you for that. I'll see you again tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Meanwhile, traditional open markets here in Korea have endured their fair share of hardships amid the presence of supermarket chains and online shopping. Well, these markets are now seeking to embrace the digital platform to overcome challenges brought on by the pandemic. Do take a look. Traditional markets here in Korea have seen a sharp decline in foot traffic amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Amid these quiet times, the atmosphere is unusually buoyant today at this traditional market in Western Seoul. A full studio setup is ready in one corner of the market's customer service center, featuring everything from cameras and lighting to a makeshift stage. While online retailers have enjoyed an unexpected windfall amid the pandemic and the advent of contact-free shopping, Many small business owners operating brick-and-mortar stores, like those at this traditional market, are facing an existential threat. In response, traditional markets are now going digital. Shoppers can now buy goods available at the market online through Korea's major portal sites and delivery apps. Live commerce events are streamed in real time for prospective buyers interested in purchasing goods online. This is the market's third live commerce event, with merchants now having learned to focus on small details, like the lighting and camera angles. <laughs> the goods on sale today are fresh vegetables, grains, traditional side dishes, and denim jeans. <laughs> The merchants even got their friends to model their clothing. They might have already done this before, but the merchants are still dealing with a few butterflies as they prepare to start their live broadcast. Today's live commerce event is about to begin. The merchants are trying something they've never done before, so naturally, small mistakes crop up here and there.
The nerves got the better of this merchant, who momentarily forgot what he wanted to say. But their efforts are appreciated by those tuning in, who leave encouraging remarks in the comment section. In the face of an unprecedented crisis, traditional market vendors are showing no fear in trying new ideas and taking on fresh challenges to protect their businesses and livelihoods. A patient's battle against COVID-19 often extends beyond his or her negative test after treatment as he or she experiences a prolonged recovery period from post viral symptoms. Concerns are also mounting amid reports of reinfection, raising questions over the body's ability to produce sufficient antibodies against COVID-19. Now I have Professor Kim moon Yu, Director of the Global Development Centre at the Yonsei University Health System. Welcome back, Professor Kim. Hi. And I also have Dr. David Kwak from Sun Chen Yang University Hospital. Welcome back, Dr. Kwak. Thanks for having me. Professor Kim, before we touch upon the post-infection symptoms of COVID-19, let's touch upon a local headline that is raising quite a bit of concern here. Now, we had a passing of an elderly woman in her 70s who received mm -hmm. the flu shot yesterday and was yes. found dead today. Yep. This story also follows that of a boy, a 17-year-old boy last week who received mm -hmm. his flu shot on Wednesday mm -hmm. and passed away on Friday. Now, the concern is, is there a link, a possible link between these unfortunate passings and the flu vaccine? What are your thoughts? Well, uh, if the vaccine is uh, delivered and stored properly and injected properly, uh, there's a very low risk uh, of uh, having this kind of uh, very severe complications like mortality. As I reviewed some cases in Korea, uh, we had a case about one, um, 2009. There was a 64-year-old woman who had a uh, 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 Miller, uh, Miller Fisher syndrome, which is kind of uh, uh, paralysis symptoms after the uh, flu vaccine and uh, uh, she was admitted to hospital and she died of aspiration pneumonia but it was a few months later so it's very uncommon and still we don't have the uh, information right now it's very hard to relate uh, the flu vaccine and the mortality Usually, uh, most uh, fast and urgent and critical side effects is the uh, uh, allergy reaction, anaphylaxis. But uh, the information we have till now is very hard to conclude that uh, relationship. Right. Yes, Professor Kim, well, investigations are still underway and hopefully we'll have answers uh, later. Uh, Dr. Kwak, amid this scenario, what words of advice would you give to those who seek to, who are hoping to, avoid a twindemic amid this scenario? 
Well, I, I, I would suggest that don't be panicked just because of these two cases. These, as Dr. Kim mentioned, has no scientific proof that they were related to the injections. So we can keep on going with the, the regular schedule of vaccinations, and I would urge everyone to, to, to still uh, get uh, vaccinations for uh, influenza. Uh, now is about the right time that, that we all should go in and get the vaccination. So I would urge everyone to go ahead and uh, do, uh, do get the vaccinations. Right. Uh, Professor Kim, here in Korea, as we saw in the video then, more than 90% of patients who have survived COVID-19 then suffer from related after effects, including fatigue, brain fog, among others. How would you explain the relatively widespread and perhaps long-term health repercussions of COVID-19? Well, uh, we don't have the defi definite answer yet. And uh, as uh, COVID-19 belongs to the better coronavirus, we can compare with the previous ones such as SARS and MERS. Uh, the scale was quite uh, small compared to this one, but there are few reports about uh, chronic problems after SARS and MERS. Uh, for example, we have a study from Hong Kong that about 40% surviving uh, SARS had a uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, we have another uh, study from UK that uh, patients who are admitted to a uh, hospital because of SARS or MERS, or even ICU, they have uh, such uh, long-term problems with the lung or some depression and anxiety. And uh, there is a Canadian study uh, comparing sleep uh, disturbances who survived uh, SARS. So uh, it's not a totally new one, but uh, this COVID-19 is uh, very uh, uh, severe because uh, it might cause some organ damage such as heart and lung and brain. So people might feel weak because of heart failure and uh, alveolar function might be decreased and uh, the brain. Uh, you might have stroke or a seizure or some kind of uh, paralysis called uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And there's another possible explanation that uh, COVID-19 causes some clot disease. So uh, every organ needs blood supply. And if it's obstructed by clots, you're going to have some trouble. So uh, these are the possible uh, uh, explanations. But still, uh, we have to study more. Right. Uh, Dr. Kwok, are there any other common health repercussions of COVID-19 that we haven't touched upon right now? Well, Dr. Kim pretty much mentioned most of them. Um, the WHO, and particularly I'm referring to, I'm going to be referring to what Mayo Clinic has stated in regards to the long-term effects after the COVID-19. They have found that many people are uh, suffering from fatigue, shortness of breath, coughing, possibly from the remaining sequelae from the disease itself. And also people were complaining of a lot of headache and, and joint pains even. But what's more, uh, what, what is more peculiar about this disease is that a lot of people were uh, seem to be having, are seem to be having uh, mental alterations, as in dementia-like symptoms, but also uh, 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 what's called brain fog. It, it's it's uh, it's where people are going through a, a, a difficulty thinking, so they can't really come up with their right uh, clear decisions, or they are sometimes having trouble coming up with different words, or they're having difficulties in calculations, that sort of things. Indeed, COVID-19 has or can affect multiple organs, including the nervous system, as our experts here in the studio have said. And a recent study shows a third of COVID-19 patients experience neurological conditions. Now, I have Jeffrey Clark, one of the researchers of that particular study from Northwestern University, live on the line. Welcome, Jeffrey. Hi, thank you. Right, Jeffrey, let's start with the findings of your study. How many COVID-19 patients experience neurological disorders and what are some of the more frequent neurological um, manifestations? So our study looked specifically at those COVID-19 patients whose illness was severe enough for them to be hospitalized. So all of the figures that we report um, about prevalence of symptoms, these are specifically in COVID patients who were hospitalized. So we were able to break down the prevalence of symptoms over time. So basically when we looked at what we found, uh, by the time these patients got to the hospital, about 40% of them had experienced at least one neurological symptom. By the time their hospitalization was concluded, that number was up to just over 80%. Mm -hmm. So most common among those symptoms uh, were things like headache, dizziness, myalgias, uh, alteration in the sense of taste and smell, 
but also quite common was encephalopathy with uh, about just over 30% of patients experiencing this. Um, and this was actually fairly concerning because encephalopathy is on the more severe end of what you can consider uh, neurologic manifestations. And this is really going to show up as patients with difficulty orienting to their surroundings uh, with lower levels of consciousness and difficulty focusing, paying attention to tasks. I see. Professor Kim, I believe you have a question for Jeffrey. Sure, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Clark, uh, it was very impressive to review your article, including more than 500 patients. I'm curious that uh, was there any uh, statistically significant difference between uh, the patients who had underlying neurological disorders or not? Yes, there actually was. So we ended up showing that having a history of neurological disease uh, had a couple of statistically significant effects. One was on the likelihood of developing encephalopathy, uh, as I had just mentioned, but also um, looking at outcomes. So using the modified Rankin scale to describe basically how patients are doing functionally uh, when it's time for them to be discharged from the hospital. Uh, among other things, a history of neurological disease contributed both to the development of encephalopathy uh, as in those patients had a higher likelihood of developing encephalopathy, as well as having a worse um, disposition at uh, discharge. Mm. Dr. Kwok, is there anything that you would like to ask, Jeffrey? Thank you. Um, so uh, having said, uh, having uh, covered the encephalopathy, I'm quite more personally curious about the brain fog. Uh, I would like to ask um, if the patients who uh, had uh, the symptoms of brain fog, if uh, the symptoms faded away uh, eventually as the time passes, or, or it, if it was persistent. And I was also curious as to know, um, what was the, the longevity and the duration of brain fog when the people uh, who are having them? So it's a really important question and I'm, I'm also curious in uh, asking this question myself. So our study was limited to a retrospective analysis of patients during their hospitalization. So the the issues of like prolonged brain fog really weren't emerging at that time. So while like our study doesn't specifically address that, um, Dr. Igor Koralnik, who was uh, in charge of our study, opened a clinic at Northwestern, the uh, facility uh, medical system where we performed the study uh, specifically to see patients with long-term neurological manifestations. So we're actively studying that, actively collecting that data. And we hope that we can uh, uh, end up sharing that soon uh, as has been mentioned, other studies have looked at basically fatigue uh, as a symptom that seems to be prolonged for a, a course of several months in, in a number of patients. The brain fog itself, again, at this point, how long that's going to last for some people. Um, some people are clearly recovering well, some people less so. But again, hopefully we uh, are able to share that the data that we're collecting from the clinic at Northwestern soon. Right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. All right, Jeffrey, thank you for making the time to talk to us live at this hour with, the, with your thoughts, of course. Thank you. Right. Professor Kim, going back to the after effects of COVID-19, quite a number of people have reported losing their hearing amid their fight with the virus, which uh, experts say is rare but possible with, with cases both in the UK and the US. We have yet to have cases here in Korea, right? Yes. I see. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this, losing your hearing? Yeah, uh, it's very uh, new and I don't think it's common, but still we have to concern about this. And the report from the UK, uh, about 13% of the more than 120 patients have some kind of hearing loss or change or tinnitus. And this is not the only report. There's a, uh, from Mayo Clinic, they say if you're elder, you are, have more possibility to have a hearing problem or a loud tinnitus, which is a sound uh, hearing from your own ears. And from the recent uh, report from Johns Hopkins, they did a autopsy of uh, uh, deceased uh, COVID-19 patient, about uh, three cases, and two of them found uh, coronavirus from their middle ear. So this is not an enough evidence to uh, connect COVID-19 with uh, hearing problem, but uh, it's uh, reasonably suspicious. And uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon is not found in SARS or MERS, so it's concerning. 
And there are some sporadic cases of sudden hearing loss uh, in many countries. So we think that coronavirus is uh, neuronal, uh, is causing neuronal inflammation. And we have another evidence such as loss of taste or smelling problem. So somehow it has a connection with some nerve uh, inflammation. So uh, is that the only uh, reason to have a hearing problem? Uh, I would uh, put more things such as during the course of COVID-19 treatment, we have to use some medications and some of the medication might uh, <coughs> cause hearing problems. So there's another thing we have to consider. And uh, uh, every person who recovered from COVID-19, I think they have to go through some kind of a screening test before the hearing problem gets worse. And finally, I want to add more, one more thing that uh, since the patients go out and they uh, complain their hearing loss, he hearing problem, but if you do the check, uh, it seems okay. So that might be because we are wearing the mask and the mask itself, uh, you have to speak a little bit louder. So uh, not all the people have to worry, but uh, as I told you, the screening is necessary, I guess. I see. Um, Dr. Kwok, are post-viral symptoms more common among patients perhaps who had a more severe case of COVID-19? Well, that seems like it, but um, I would also like to refer to WHO's statement on this, is that uh, they have studied a vast amount of people who's recovered from severe illness from COVID-19 to have long-term after effects, but they haven't found a specific number of mild uh, mildly uh, uh, diseased patients to have long-term effects. Another fact that they also mentioned is that they, uh, but yet still, they found uh, many, many people in their 20s and 30s who've had mild symptoms to still have long-term effects. So these are two different factors coercing us against each other, but it seems like it's more likely that people who's had the disease more, uh, more severe would likely to, uh, are likely to have uh, more um, prevalent long-term um, side effects from the disease disease as uh, compared to the people who's had it much more mild. Right. Uh, Professor Kim, there have reportedly been at least 20 confirmed cases of COVID-19 reinfection, but I understand seeking to keep track of all these numbers may be quite a challenge. Would you care to explain why? Well, uh, the test we do uh, real-time PCR and it, it uh, picks out every strain of this COVID-19. But uh, if you say reinfection, that means <clears throat> you get an infection, the previous episode, you recovered, you're negative, and you have another infection. And uh, you must have a paired sample to compare wh whether the strain is same or not. Usually we don't have the previous sample because after the test, it's not necessary to keep it. But there are some few cases that confirmed reinfection and uh, different strains such as uh, the V strain with the Daegu outbreak, and now we have a GH strain. So if you have the both sample, you can prove it, but it's, uh, you have to go through a sequencing process, which is very laborious, and usually we don't do that. So that's the reason uh, it's very hard to confirm whether it's reinfection or it's kind of a recurrence. And the real-time PCR picks out very sensitively, so uh, sometimes it's positive even though the virus is not alive. Like, I mean, uh, replication, competent virus uh, is positive, but some particles only might also show positive also. So uh, uh, it's, it's an uh, issue very difficult, but since we have an antibody after the infection, still we have a chance to get uh, immunity and uh, uh, everybody's guessing that the antibody will remain about three months and uh, even though you recover from uh, COVID-19, still you have to be cautious and uh, keep social distancing and hand hygiene and mask and everything. Of course. Yeah. So reinfection would be you being infected by two different strains of COVID-19. Yes. And retesting positive would be you had it first, you test again, and the test says you're positive and yeah, it's still yeah. the same virus there. That's, that's how we, we know until now. I yeah. see. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kwak, a woman in the Netherlands, as we saw in the video before our studio session, has become the first known case to die from COVID-19 after being reinfected with the virus. Now, she is said to have experienced far more severe symptoms during her second battle with the virus. Have we been able to determine if this is usually the case for those who are reinfected? 
Well, there have been no formal studies that actually uh, covered all these issues. But it seems like the three cases, to my knowledge, that was from Hong Kong, the United States, and also in the Netherlands, they seem to have had stronger symptoms with their second uh, suspected uh, infection. But for, for the first two, the one in Hong Kong and the United States, even at their most severe uh, case, it, it was still mild. They were having very mild symptoms. Uh, the, uh, the case in U.S. was also having very mild pneumonia. So I think this particular case in the Netherlands with the lady being 89 years old and having cancer as her basic uh, underlying disease, I think it was more of a particular case. Oh, I see. Before we go, Professor Kim, a very, a very few words on perhaps how to keep safe now that more, many more people are seeing to venture outdoors to enjoy the scenes of autumn. Well, yeah. Uh, we already have the answers, I guess. So, yes, uh, we do. Yeah. And when you're indoors, you have uh, about 20 times more higher to get infected. When you're outdoors, you are less. But anyway, if crowded, you still need a uh, mask and hand hygiene. So, yeah, we, keep, we have to keep in mind that uh, social distancing for a couple of more months since uh, this pandemic will uh, finish. Right. All right, Professor Kim, thank you for your thoughts. And you. Dr. Kwak, as always, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of Tuesday's coverage of COVID-19. Now, do join us again tomorrow as we take a look at the different approaches adopted by leaders worldwide to their diagnosis of the disease. In the meantime, do take care. See you tomorrow.